subtle disagreements. Yet through the ages, people from around the world have tried to limit the brutality of war. It was this humanitarian spirit that led to the first Geneva Convention of 1864 and to the birth of modern international humanitarian law. Setting the basic limits on how wars can be fought, these universal laws of war protect those not fighting, as well as those no longer able to. To do this, a distinction must always be made between who or what may be attacked and who or what must be spared and protected. Most importantly, civilians can never be targeted. To do so is a war crime. Even war has rules. Good morning and very welcome to the Swedish Red Cross seminar, Civilian Population, Victims When Law of War is Violated. Welcome to all of you here in the beautiful and strategically important island of Gotland. And welcome to all of you watching online. My name is Natalie Peel, and I'll guide you through the next hour that I'm sure will be both interesting and provide us with new knowledge and insights. Even war have limits. Today, we see several examples of states and armed groups violating international humanitarian law, the law of war. And this, of course, affects the civilian population. Their protection is an urgent matter, and it is an urgent matter also for Sweden. Maybe you saw the very strong pictures from Mosul and Damascus just yesterday. You'll soon have the opportunity to listen to Yves Dacor, who's the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who will provide you with a review and, uh, of present conflict trends in the world, how they affect the civilian population, and what he thinks the future will look like. This will be followed by a very interesting panel discussion with the Chief of Operation of the Swedish Defence Forces, Jan Hörnqvist, Senior Legal Advisor for, for the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Ola Engdahl, and the Chief of Staff and Senior Legal Advisor from the Swedish Red Cross, Cecilia Tengrot. But first of all, let me introduce you to the Secretary General of the Swedish Red Cross. Very welcome, Anders Danielsson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur Uv, d'accord, very welcome. Welcome to the seminar, welcome to Gotland and Almedalen. Uh, it's lovely to see so many of you here and participating and listening to this very uh, important issue today. My name is Anders Danielsson, I'm the Secretary General to the Swedish Red Cross. And uh, as you heard, we are going to discuss international humanitarian law, or in other words, the laws of armed conflicts. Um, just a few remarks before I will give the, the floor to, to if the, the importance and the, re the relevance of international humanitarian law cannot be understated at any time. It's one of the few tools that exist to, that can provide protection for some of the most vulnerable groups uh, during an armed conflict. Perhaps, perhaps some of you think that this is a false statement. It's not. When you see news from the media, when you see conflict, it's easy to despair and think there are no rules, there are no limits of conflicts. Civilians are targeted, hospital and religious sites are destroyed, and humanitarian assistance, assistance is stopped. And yes, international uh, humanitarian law and humanity in general is facing clear challenges today. We know that addressing these will demand a hard work and honest engagement from a wide range of actors. There are many reasons for hosting this seminar today. Uh, one is that we are seeing that knowledge about international humanitarian uh, law is also, have also an increasing relevance for Sweden. So, I'm honored and happy to introduce uh, Yves Dacor. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ernest. And good morning, everybody. Uh, very pleased to, to see you. Very pleased also to be here in, in Visby, uh, Almedalen. 
uh, as you mentioned, strategic island, right? If you look yes. on a map, yes, <laughs> uh, uh, for sure. But also a strategic moment because I'm deeply convinced that uh, the questions we should ask ourselves when it comes to international law should be at the core of what we discuss right now in Visby. And if I look uh, Sweden, uh, what you do right now as a country, uh, your interventions or your reflections about the world, what is happening also in Syria, in Middle East, what's happening in Mali and other places, have an influence in your country more and more. So I think investing into making sure that international law is respecting is not just for the sake of it, but it's an investment in the future. I have no doubt on that one. So I just would like maybe to start to give you four trends. There could be hundreds of trends, but let's say four trends when it comes to international law and when it comes to war, right? And what we see as the International Community of Red Cross. Take us as one perspective. There is a plenty of different perspectives and we'll hear that in the panel. So the first one, no surprise for you, is that we are confronted with conflict which are lasting. We call in our jargon protracted conflict. And I think it's important to know we are don't deal anymore with conflict we are just happening for a few months or a few years and then end. We don't see end to conflict. And this is really changing the way war is fought. If you look at Afghanistan, remember Afghanistan? Now Afghanistan is 35 years of conflict, 15 years of international interventions. Few years ago, everybody thought, okay, somewhat the international forces will withdraw and maybe find solutions. And I would say today, we've never seen so much violence in Afghanistan. We've never seen so much tensions within the society. The fragmentation of the state, the non-state armed group, the difficulty is to really make sure that civilian population can have access to health, can just have access to basic services, is dramatic. So protracted conflict. I can tell you already, and I don't need to be very smart to tell you that, I can tell you already that Syria will stay with us for years, if not decade. I can tell you already that Yemen, I can tell you Iraq, Libya, just if I look at Lib if I just I look at, at Middle East, without talking about North East Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, and now these days, if you focus in Philippines, some places you can see also so long-term conflict. So when we think about international law, we always need to think not just at a small moment, but over time, and what it means for civilian population. So protracted conflict, which means also what does that mean for country, for the international community when they intervene. It can't be short term, it always has to be long term. Second point, which is a real somewhat new trend, in a sense it's much more clear right now, is war are more and more urban. So the urbanization of our own life, we as a human being are now living more than 50% of us in urban area, of course you see that more and more in war, very clearly. If I look at my own organization, in our modern history, we had some moments where we had to work in war, Sarajevo, Grozny, for example. But it was rare, it was specific. Today, if I look at our own organization, Mogadishu will be a place, Kabul, Damascus, Homs, Hidlib, you just mentioned Mosul, Raqqa, all these places are urban area. And of course, the way war are fought in urban area is very different. It's more complex. The nature of violence is different. The impact is bigger. We see that systematically in war, in urban area, you have more people dying, especially more civilian. It is more difficult. When you see also the method used, you see these days a mix of method. You see besiege area again. You see a lot of places where the, uh, you know, the, the town are as siege, like in the Middle East, Taiz today in Yemen, a lot of places in Syria, at the same time also using new technology like drone, and it, that what is amazing is the mix of tactics. And last but not least, when you think about urban area, think about systems also. Everything is interconnected. Think about WISBY here, you know, water sanitation, health, all that is interconnected. So when you have explosive weapons arriving, when you know, you're targeting, it's immediately have a huge impact on people. And what we know also about area, urban area is even when the war is over, it takes a lot of time to just not only reconstruct building, but also reconstruct, in fact, social fabric. Look at Beirut, it's a good example in Lebanon. You know, today Beirut has recovered in terms of building, if you would go there, but in terms of social fabric, bring the community together. 
it's a huge issue and it will take decades. And we know that. So we know also right now that in some places like in Iraq, like in Yemen, like in Syria, towns are at the core of the war. And it's changing the way war is fought, but it's also changing the way civilians are under pressure. The third trend is possibly the fact that, and it's not a new trend, but now it's confirmed, is the fact that war are first and foremost internal. In IHL jargon, they are non-international armed conflict. In other jargon, you can, they are civilian war. But what is new is this war are more and more internationalized. So it's a civilian. Look at the Syrian war. Look at the Yemeni war. Look at the Northeast Nigeria war. What you do have, you have a number of actors which are first and foremost internal. Government fighting, rebels, several type of rebels. But then you have more and more these days international actors coming in to intervene, to support. Through proxy, supporting government, stopping the rebels, which makes war extremely complex. Imagine today if you be Yemeni. How do you navigate, you as a person and a civilian, between the different warring party, the government, the coalitions, the international forces, who support whom? What does that mean? And of course, if you are a state, if you are a government, you see that maybe rationally. But if you are a civilian population, it makes your life extremely difficult. What we see as a trend also is, and this is maybe something we are nervous about that, is we see somewhat when the war is civilian, when it goes on, when there is also a lot of international actors in intervening through proxy, we see somewhat a diffusion of responsibility. And here we have really something to ask ourselves. Who is responsible when you train forces, for example? Are you responsible of the force that are fighting right now? Where does responsibility end? Where does it start? When you gather intelligence in a coalition, are you responsible of the way the intelligence is used to target people? That's a good example, good questions. We should ask ourselves when it comes to Iraq, when it comes to Syria, when it comes to Yemen. How are states somewhat living to their responsibility when they support other states, other proxy, to do the war on their name? That's a big, big, really, question. And there is a risk today that the responsibility is somewhat diffuse. It's not me doing the war. I don't know. I'm supporting, I'm training. Hmm, interesting. Where is, in fact, the responsibility? And here it's a really big question we need to ask ourselves because we know what's happening right now, and a good example, in Mosul and in Raqqa will have a huge impact in the world because all Sunni people will look into that carefully. How is this war fought? What does that mean? So it has a huge impact in terms of responsibility. So civilian war more internationalized, and of course with the real questions about what it means in terms of responsibility or diffusion of responsibility. The fourth one, and here I would be happy to hear our panelists, because I'm not sure I'm getting right, but there is something new about the war, and maybe it's a different distance between here, our population in Sweden, in Europe, in the US, in Canada, and the war. I would argue that Iraq and Afghanistan at the beginning of this century, people still felt that their country was at war because there were soldiers on the, on the ground, right? And there were quite a lot of soldiers, right? Right now, the way war fought in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, is war through special forces, through proxy, with cyber, with artificial intelligence. And it makes people away from war. It makes parliament away from war. It makes our own, in a way, people away from war somewhat. And we need to try to grasp what it means in terms of respect of IHL. And what I've seen is government and army will also operate more at ease when there is possibly a pressure and understanding from their own society about what is the level of responsibility in which they engage. Last but not least, when I mix about distance, what is new for me is I've looked at all the survey. And the survey tells us about perception. Europe has never been that safe, if you look at numbers of people dying. At the same time, Europe feels deeply insecure because of terrorism, because of migration, because of different issues. And when you feel unsafe, you have a different relationship also with war, with civilian, with the other, right? And you feel the other maybe is less important than you. And there is something about that when you talk about international humanitarian law. 
And that's an important element to think about what do we want from our country when it comes to respecting international humanitarian law, when it is about respecting standards. What are the standards? What do we want from our own country? And I think there is something to be, to be looking into that. Thank you. Thank you, Yves Dacor. Please stay here. Uh, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for the panel discussion, and I'm honored to welcome Jan Tornqvist, Chief of Operations, Swedish Defense Forces, Ola Engdahl, Senior Legal Advisor, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and Cecilia Tengrup, Chief of Staff and Senior Legal Advisor at the Swedish Red Cross. Very welcome. Thank you. you put your close so you can you see in front of the camera, <laughs> yes. I think we still have to start with the obvious question. Is international humanitarian law still relevant? Because to be honest, we mostly hear and read about the violations. Yes, it's, it's still relevant, of course. It's, I mean, it's, it has a very important role to, to protect those not participating in war, as we saw in, in the movie. And that's in, in interest for all, for all states and the international mm -hmm. community as, as a whole. And without international humanitarian law, we would not really know how the war would be governed, would be, and to know when there is a war crime has been committed. So it's, it's, it's very important. And also we see that people are actually also prosecuted, even though it's not so easy in ongoing armed conflict like in Syria. So, but we have examples, like here in Sweden, that we have national prosecutions now for, for persons that have committed war crimes. So absolutely still not. And that we couldn't have without, without the... In, of course, but it's the respect <coughs> for the international humanitarian <coughs> law that, that is lacking. Yeah, can I just also say, I also feel that we always look at law as something far away, but it's also a common grammar mm. that's somewhat a cross-culture that we have, mm. which help us. And I see that you know, with people also, not just with army or non-state armed groups, I see with people that they have an understanding of what is this common grammar that we have agreed somewhat. It's a common framework, it's a universal framework which unites us and I think we should never underestimate that dimension. And if we let it go, we also let go somewhat the ability between community, between people, to mm. understand what is wrong, what is right, and to be governed by that. The armed forces, so what's your perspective, uh, <laughs> Jan? We, co we consider us as a tool for the government and for the people uh, trading peace in the world, and in, in Sweden in this case. And uh, the dif difference between us and criminals uh, without any laws in, in wartime, uh, that makes a chaos. I mean, uh, I'm very proud of having a job as the chief of joint operations in Sweden. And uh, that's more dependent on that we have rules in our action. We are uh, le legitimate to, to, to uh, use deadly force in certain conditions, but not uh, as, as we wish. We have rules to, to, to obey, but we that's very important. It's, Im it's important, but we also see <coughs> that the conflicts are very different. Uh, I mean, the, 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 like you said, they are internationalized, but they are internal, uh, they are protracted, they are more urban when, than when the rules were actually drafted. But are they still relevant? Yes, I believe. You would say that yes, yeah. they still work? Absolutely, they work. I think what still maybe doesn't work is not so much the rules. Yeah. We have a very good set of rules. We have a very good architecture. The real question is then, as always, who applies the rule and what are the sanction mechanisms? Mm -hmm. And I think let's also recognize that we do have a problem around that in a time where in some countries it works, but let's say the international community is maybe slightly blocked right now. Uh, we do see competition between countries. I found that at the level of UN Security Council, which, by the way, have a very strong responsibility when it comes to security and peace in the world, I see, if I look at Syria, for example, the extreme difficulty for the UN Security Council to be able to forge collective decisions, and they should be able to do that, right? They have the tools. So it's not about the tools and the rules. It's about, in fact, our own ability as an international community to move forward and Absolutely. to make it happen. Uh, we are here in Sweden. It's a beautiful summer day in the strategically important island of but Gotland. Cold. Cold, yes. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Everything, no, is, everything is relevant. It's a question of culture. Relative. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, but sometimes we, we talk about war and the, and the law of, of uh, international humanitarian law as something very distant, you know, for the wars over there. And we haven't, I mean, we've been very privileged here in Sweden. We haven't had an armed conflict for over 200 years. So why is humanitarian so law actually so important and relevant for Sweden? Maybe more today than ever. You, Ola, you, yeah, you were well, uh, started yeah. discussing <laughs> it before. 
Well, as you've also said, it's an it's important legal framework for, for all, for the international community as a whole, and also for in the Security Council, as Sweden taken an active part to, to strengthen the IHL in resolutions, in peace operations, in uh, resolutions regarding protection of civilians, but specifically regarding healthcare, in this landmark resolution 2286, for instance. Uh, protection of children. Sweden is uh, heading a formal working group on, on children and armed conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important in the work of the Security Council to always try to strengthen and keep strong language of IHL and responsibility for violations of IHL in resolutions. And, and Can I also make one, one thing concrete? I mean, you are a country which is exposed also to migration mm -hmm. right, over the last few years. And migration as a crisis, not just as a normal process. And I think if I look at the migrants coming here in, in this country, um, uh, some of them are coming from clearly uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Syria, as an example, Afghanistan. And I would argue most of them are not coming because they find it's fun to come in Sweden. They come because they can't have the choice to stay in their country, right? Because they're forced to leave. And forced to leave means that because the level of violence, the fact that there's just no solutions for the people on the spot, and I really said also on healthcare in danger, one of my major worries in Syria, for example, in Afghanistan, is right now healthcare is systematically attacked mm -hmm. by the parties. I mean, you imagine two minutes yourself, you are in a neighborhood and you want to stay, but your health system is gone, you know? The water system is gone. What do you do? Uh, and I think this is why international humanitarian is so important, not just for Syrian, but also for Swedish people, if they want to live in a world where people can make a choice to stay at home. And I really mean that. It's a very strategic element. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Sweden, using your spot at the Security Council to push issues related to protecting healthcare is very, very concrete. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very careful, because if we allow that, people will continue to go. They have no other choices than to leave, really. We started, uh, we started talking about the, the, uh, what action is actually necessary in order to ensure uh, respect for IHL. And we started discussing the Security Council. Mm -hmm. But what is currently being made in Sweden by the armed forces, by the foreign ministry, by humanitarian organizations, both on a national level but also on a global level, in order to ensure bigger respect for IHL, because you're all very, you're all, of, all of you agree that the rules are relevant. They are still applicable. We don't have a problem with that. So it's more about implementation, making sure they're being followed. So what what is actually being concretely done, and what is being done? Is it enough? I mean, for instance, what are the armed forces doing at the moment to ensure respect for humanitarian law? Let me take an example. We have uh, forces in Mali, an ISR unit I in Timbuktu, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance uh, unit. And they are protecting uh, uh, and, and also guarding uh, what is happening in the area, collecting intelligence. An important part there is to collect uh, intelligence from the population. And we have noticed uh, lately that they are frightened to talk to UN people, especially person in uniform because there is a death list that they have actually used the terrorists to, to take out people that have been able to talk to us. Uh, of course, all those violations towards the rules and regulations uh, are reported. I, I believe that's very important to have a picture of uh, what is ongoing, who is the actor, what are they doing. So we afterwards, uh, when we have uh, a clear picture, can try to, 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 to search and catch those uh, violations uh, and people doing that and set them to trial because otherwise uh, they will continue doing it. But that, that's uh, what they use towards uh, uh, civilian society, if I say so, today. Uh, our uh, weakness uh, of handled conflicts where, where they use onliner uh, warfare, if I say so, they, they push towards women, children, and use them as targets. Uh, and we, we have a situation in the middle of a, of a town, for example, makes it very difficult to act. But intelligence collecting is very important to, to have a picture of what is happening, who is doing it, and uh, try to track them, catch them, and set them to trial afterwards. So when, uh, when? Uh, uh, my sense is, is if you ask us what can we do better or how do we do that, I think there is first and foremost an, a responsibility which is coming to all of us depending where we are. And if I look at what is extremely important is if I start with, in fact, government or, or army, one integration of international law. We have, we've learned that knowledge is not enough. Awareness is not enough. 
you need to make sure that in the standard operating procedures, you have integrated, in fact, international emitter law very clearly. So the integration is absolutely critical. It's very fundamental. If I look at our own organization, it means also being able to connect with a different party to the conflict. It means being able to talk today with the Taliban, uh, as an example, about, in fact, how do they conduct hostilities. It's very complex, it's not easy, but I think we need to be able to discuss with the different parties to the conflict about how they operate. What does that mean? It means treatment of prisoner. I'm deeply convinced that the way prisoners are treated, you know, in a context says a lot <coughs> about not just respect of international and law, but it says a lot about what's happening in the country. Right now, for example, I have a lot of concern in Afghanistan, where I see condition of detentions and treatment of prisoners going worse. And I think it has an impact on, again, the entire international community, because there was people arrested by the international community years ago, you know, giving responsibility. So I think there are also questions of how do we manage this very important responsibility. And last but not least, it's also be more aware about the responsibility of the state. Where does it lie? You know, what does that mean? Being more open about the questions, which is maybe how do we reflect our responsibility, but also perception. And I know it's complex. So when you are in Mali, I can imagine, or in Iraq, people can perceive you also as party of the conflict, right? Yes. Even if you do, I'm doing peace. And I think, how do we manage that intelligently and being able to look into that? That's, that's, that's a big issue. So that's also actually an issue both for humanitarian organization and for the armed forces. Yes. Not only action, but actually <laughs> how are you being perceived yes. yeah. by the... And uh, Olaf, because I know there's a lot of work going on in the in the si since Sweden has a seat on the Security mm. Council concerning. But what is doing being done regarding IHL? Yeah, in the, in in the Security Council, we will we will uh, we try to have uh, strengthen the language in as I said before in in resolutions in peace operations and and other works that we are we are doing in the Security Council speci specifically on the protection of civilians and healthcare and. Also, in that respect, we have this international the delegation of international law and uh, disarmament in Sweden mm -hmm. that uh, is headed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Swedish Red Cross is also a member of that. And we have a working group looking specifically on the protection of healthcare in, in armed conflict to take concrete steps based on, on the recommendation of the Secretary General on, the, uh, on, on these issues. So there are happen things are happening on different levels, so to say. And I, I also want to uh, say the same thing here, that it's very important to implement the, the law, like uh, the Swedish manual for, for international humanitarian law, for instance, that they are being used now by the armed forces. This is really the implementation of the law is important in all for forces. Just, uh, Cecilia, because the Swedish Red Cross also has a special knowledge, I would say, concerning IHL, but also a special mission, you know, in Sweden, how, how, are, how is the Swedish Red Cross pushing the, the agenda when it comes to international humanitarian law? What are we, what is the organization concretely doing? Well, as a national society, uh, we have an, uh, what's called an auxiliary role to the state when it comes to IHL. And, uh, we are part of uh, these delegations and the IHL committee that the government runs. And of course, there we try to influence and push the agenda towards uh, humanitarian uh, issues. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's wonderful to work uh, for national society in Sweden, because Sweden has a long-standing tradition of being very strong and, and developing IHL. And I would say in the last maybe three or four years, there has been some uh, things have started to happen. Th this delegation of disarmament and international law, it was dormant for maybe 15 <laughs> years, 10 years. And uh, suddenly it came back, and that shows that there is broad recognition in Sweden that we need to approach IHL and be a voice for humanity, especially now when it is, it's a tough world out there, and there are not that many states that are able or willing to, to step forward for pure humanitarian issues, and Sweden <laughs> is a unique country in that way. Uh, another example is, uh, I'm holding uh, several books here, but this one <laughs> I would like to show. Uh, the, I, the, the National IHL Committee, uh, which uh, Swedish Red Cross, the Swedish Armed Forces, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and others are part to, uh, have a special uh, mission to disseminate IHL and to work for its strengthening. Uh, this publication, it's the, the last one in the series that they produce, and it's about Oh, the title is so boring, but information about IHL. 
but it really is the basics. It's what you need to know about IHL. <coughs> the aim is not the armed forces, because like Ola said, and, and the armed forces just uh, have produced their own manual on IHL. But this is directed to the general population, to civil agencies. Because something that I don't think too many people in Sweden are aware of is that there are so many different actors in society, in cor including corporate uh, companies, that have specific roles and duties under IHL, especially in Sweden, given our total defense concept. So I'll show my, my second book. I, isn't it also <laughs> important, uh, I'm just as, uh, asking uh, parliamentarians that actually yes. sometimes make decisions on sure. what mm -hmm. uh, you know, what situations to actually right. get in, engaged in or not. Uh, mm. Do they, today, do they actually have the knowledge enough about the, the you know, decisions they make or? Well, I mean, you can always debate what's enough knowledge about <laughs> IHL. As an IHL lawyer, I wish everybody knew the Geneva Conventions by heart. I, uh, maybe that's a too high a benchmark. But, if, I mean, but you're, you're, it's an important point that we know today that there are many more actors that need to have at least basic knowledge of I, IHL. And so in this book, there are specific chapters devoted to journalists, for example, because what we see today is reporting from or about conflicts. You need to recognize, if you're watching a war crime being committed, how do you report on that? What does that mean in, in terms of who can you photograph? Can you show images of detained people? There are rules for this in IHL, so large groups need to have at least a basic knowledge of IHL. I would say as a parliament, I think it's critical that you understand uh, which frame framework uh, is applica applicable to your country. I mean, uh, you have to understand that, and it's not really complex, but you need to agree. If your uh, uh, country, and I think we're living in a world where Sweden, as an example, and most of European countries, they don't just operate anymore at, you know, in, at home. You have to operate in the world. I mean, you have operated already in a lot of countries, if I look at, at Sweden, which has changed quite a bit over the last, uh, let's say, 15 years. Very critical that the parliament knows, you know, what is the framework which is applicable to the interventions of their own country. It will help when you then discuss issues over time, responsibility, what it means. And we know, if we agree with the fact that protracted conflict are sta starting, we know that there will be issues about you know, responsibility, cri criminal issues. I mean, that needs to be understood. And I'm really seeing over time, I'm thinking about Germany, I'm thinking about the UK, I'm thinking about the US, for example, very different country. But they really had to reflect at the level of the parliament, you know, was it human rights law, was it national law, was it international law, how it applies. And it is important to have an agreement because it helps also to have, have good discussions in terms of responsibility. I want to get to get back. Uh, uh, the, the name, the, the title of the seminar is "Civilian Population Victims When Law of War Is Violated." So I want to get back a bit to the civilian population because the rules are actually there in order, of course, also for combatants, but actually to make the armed conflicts more humane and to protect the civilians. Uh, what are the consequences for the civilian population when international humanitarian law is violated? And I'm thinking especially, you started to discussing it regarding healthcare. We know today that unfortunately it's not uncommon at all that patients, medical staff, hospitals, ambulances are being targeted. Uh, and another issue is also, are the consequences for the civilian population, are they the same? Or do we see differences uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to gender, is gender an issue how the population is uh, <coughs> affected? And this is maybe a extra interesting in Sweden since we now officially have an, an feminist foreign policy, uh, Ola. Mm. So, uh, w in regarding in terms, uh, since we have that policy, what does that mean in terms of international humanitarian law? Mm. So, back to the civilian population, the consequences for them. Uh, and also what this uh, feminist foreign policy actually means. And I just started, uh, Cecilia, because I know you've worked a lot with uh, international humanitarian law and gender. What, are the, what have you seen? Because you worked together with the ICRC on this issue. Uh, is gender a factor, how the civilian population is affected? Well, of course it is. I mean, uh, that's... Uh, we, as human beings, are affected differently due to a wide range of, of, uh, of um, reasons. It can be your gender, it can be if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're disabled. I mean, so many factors impact the way a person experiences war, the way it can cope with war. Gender is one of those uh, aspects that you will always see present, because you are either a man or a woman, most often. Um, and 
depending on that, you will have different ways of handling a war. You will also be affected by wars in different ways. And uh, I mean, obviously, this is not rocket science, science but international organizations, armed forces need to be, I think, better to recognize this and address it. How do you gather intelligence? Do you uh, gather sex and age disaggregated data? Do you analyze it and understand? And do you put the resources to address the specific vulnerabilities and also capabilities that men and women, boys and girls, may have? And as you mentioned, uh, the Swedish Red Cross, the Swedish government, and also with support from the ICRC and the armed forces, <laughs> uh, have for a couple of years conducted some studies studies on this. And uh, oh, another book I have with <laughs> me there. <laughs> it's called IHL and Gender, Some Swedish Experiences. You brought the library here. <laughs> I brought a whole library here uh, that shares kind of the, some key um, uh, ideas on, on that issue. Okay, can I just uh, say, if you talk about civilian, what, I've, what we've seen witness over the last, let's say, maybe last 10, yeah, 10 years, is a much more systematic attack against civilian population. Civilian population has always been, remember the Second World War, I mean, it, it, let's be very clear, it has always been dramatic issues, let's be very clear. But I think what we see right now, and I like the two examples you're taking, one is on healthcare, just one minute on that one. What strikes us right now is from m first minute of the conflict, healthcare is systematically targeted, so it's not an accident. You target systematically hospital, healthcare facilities, patients, doctors, in order to put pressure on the civilian population. Very clear. Syria is a terrible case, and it will be known, you will see in history, as a context where healthcare was strategically used to really put pressure on civilian population with a dramatic casualties. Yemen is the other good example. 160 attacks in 2015 just on the healthcare system. Attack means hospital being destroyed, facilities being destroyed, doctors also being targeted. What happens? No surprise. You have a healthcare system not able anymore to absorb shock. And what we have right now, it's a major cholera outbreak. And cholera, for the people who don't know, it's not a very complex sickness or epidemic to manage. It's about protocol, it's about hygiene, but they're completely not in a position to do that. So I think th there is really something to understand. It's much more systematic, and we need to be very careful about that. Rape. Rape is today, in a lot of conflict, absolutely a mass you know, a, a weapon of mass destruction, very clearly. It's not just raping one or two person. It's really raping entire uh, communities, putting pressure. And, and it's a war crime. And it's a war yeah. crime. And it is clearly used systematically again. So I think we have to really reflect when you see systematic use to that. So typically the work done that we did at the Security Council, even if I may say, as a citizen, that sometimes I'm, you know, a I'm really sometimes appeal or, or uphold uh, by the fact that uh, the Security Council is not able to do more, more job when it comes to implement really uh, seriously it, its resolution. Though the work that we do to have you know, unanimity at the level of the Security Council when it comes to healthcare, the famous 2286 resolution that Sweden pushed, that's a very important element. We need to do more. We need to make sure that the framework is more specifically applied by the international community and then that sanctions happen because that's, that's what what will happen. Otherwise, what we'll see is a systematic use against civilian population by, in fact, numbers of armed groups and also governments to really put the pressure on the civilian population. Yeah. I, I just couldn't resist when you mentioned uh, sexual and gender-based crimes. Uh, we, we all agree, basically, that it's not an issue of there is lacking rules of IHL, there is a lack of compliance. But I feel strongly there's one area where that there is a an, an, uh, question you could debate, do we need more normative rules? And that is, when it comes to specifically sexual and gender-based violence, the, some studies show that the most common perpetrator during armed conflicts, the most common perpetrator of sexual and gender-based violence is mostly the women's husband or boyfriend. It's a domestic issue. We see that that sharply goes up during conflict and other emergencies. IHL does not cover that situation. Mm. Why not? I mean, as a feminist, I can't argue, but those founding fathers of IHL, they probably didn't think of that concept, that that would be an immediate effect of armed conflict. We think about houses burning, people being shot, and that's true, that's immediate f effects of armed conflict, but there are other immediate effects that IHL today does not cover, and I think that's an issue we could push further and argue that this is not just domestic law or human rights issue. This is a core component and an immediate effect of war, and that should be covered by IHL. 
how are the armed forces uh, working with issues both of, of gender, but like for instance, you said intelligence gathering, but you also have a lot of deployments around the world with different kind of special <coughs> forces. As being said before here, uh, they have used <coughs> targeting to, to uh, women, children, as a tool for, for uh, war. And of course, it's a war crime. And for us, it's important to have uh, human, uh, human uh, intelli intelligence from all the population. And for us to uh, interconnect with, with women as well. And how Where, do you do that? Uh, we try to, to use uh, women in our uh, platoons, uh, mixed platoons. We try to, to, to uh, arrange meetings where, where women in the society are engaged and uh, invited. Try to get the picture where women, children uh, actually are in the society. Because if you ask uh, the male population in an area, they want us to protect weapon de depot, for example, uh, something military compound uh, and that type. If you ask a woman, wom the woman, uh, instead, they, they, they tell us where, where the children are in schools, daycare center, hospitals, and so forth. Uh, it gives us a broader picture and a total picture where we know wh where we can focus to protect them. And as long as they are targets in, in a war and war crime, it's very important for us to, to, to have that connection as well. The Swedish Foreign Ministry, uh, what are the <coughs> future plans now concerning, I mean, since we have the feminist foreign policy, uh, anything specially being done now when it comes to, to the gender factor? Yeah, it's, it's true what has been said here, that an eff yeah. effective implementation of IHL needs an assessment also, a gender-based mm -hmm. assessment on, because I, uh, the war affects women and men, men and boys and girls differently. But we work also in the Security Council with that and, and try to enhance these perspectives by uh, working for gender advisors in, in peace operations, for instance. But as been said before here is that there's one thing when you put in the text and get the resolution, we also need to follow it up to see how is it implemented. And now we are get starting to get back resolutions from the uh, a report from the General Secretary General to see how it has been working. And that also gives us a, a platform to, to to, to base our future work. So, so it's, a, it's a continuing process in, the, in our two years in the Security Council. Uh, uh, Eve gave us a broad picture before that today's conflicts are very complex. They're often protracted. We have a large number of actors. Uh, many of them are often non-state actors. Uh, and as the world urbanizes, we people, we move into cities. So does armed conflict. And they're taking place not only in homes, in residential areas, in hospitals. It's everywhere where we are as people. Uh, this, of course, affects the civilian population, as we heard. But I'm also working, what are the consequences, these complex, new, different kind of conflicts? What are the consequences, how humanitarian organizations work and prepare? What's the difference for the armed forces? I mean, you're no longer on a big field, you know, having <laughs> on the one side you have one army, on the other side you have another army. A and even now it feels like war are, could be very far away in Sweden. But to be honest, I don't know. We are here in Gotland. It's a very strategic place, you know. Uh, Visby has small, narrow streets. Uh, how, how the humanitarian organization, but also how does the armed forces prepare for this, train for this, and how does it change your work today already? You want me to start? Yes. <coughs> of course. Uh, it, for us, it's uh, a challenge when it comes to, to interaction with other authorities, because this is not only a matter for the armed forces. We have to be able to interact with the police, with the security police, with civilian authorities, uh, and with the society in all. Because we don't have any mandate to, to act towards uh, a criminal in Sweden. It, that's the police job. But uh, they use, of course, this grey zone we're talking talking about. So uh, I, I, I believe we have gone quite far in, in our uh, connection to the police, military police, so we know who is taking over when and how we can help and we can add on uh, resources under a police command in certain situations. And we can also secure a situation where, where other authorities are going in to help the, the society. We are very vulnerable, uh, for example, I I nationally if we not have any power, electricity power, uh, the communications are not working any longer, the water supply for the cities is not working. <coughs> we have uh, 
no no payment system that that works so that, that's also an important part for us so we are all all of the problems we have now is actually to, to make better when it comes to inter interagency in this and we are exercising and we are planning and we are doing our best to, to, to keep up with, with the challenges we are facing but of course uh, an aggressor will use this weakness in our society for humanitarian actors i think typically if i look at the international red cross uh very clear for us we've become an urban actor that's clear so we have realized that we are an urban actors it w that's the first time in our long history <laughs> which means which means what which means that when we use humanitarian actions we are also much more aware about systemic issues uh, clearly, when you intervene in a town, and you mention that uh, very clearly, you have to really look into what it means in the water sanitation, what it means in terms of health, in the electricity questions. You really need to be able to intervene, especially the water sanitation system. Mm -hmm. If I just think about Aleppo, uh, and you all follow what happened in Aleppo, we had to work with our water si sanitation system about you know, the Aleppo system. And what happens uh, in November, when the, the fight was really heavy, some of the water plants were hit by bombing, and what we did, we really work with the local authorities, which is uh, still amazing. Even in Aleppo today, you still have local authorities, you know, at the ground level with people knowing the water board. So we work with them. And what we did is we moved the system, which was collapsing, to the 19th century system. What was it? Is all the mosques have boreholes. So what we do with the local authorities, we checked, in fact, the plan where the borehole had, and we connected the borehole together to make it again a water sanitation system, at least 19th century, but still possible for the people to be able to go around. So it means what? It means also collaboration, local authorities. Possibly when we see urban area, it's also much more collaboration with cities and town. And even in war, most of the time, the HR, people who have the knowledge, the local authorities are very critical in being able to connect. Last but not least, of course, is able and more than important for an actor to really work very, very radically principled. Because you're living in a very complex environment where people are looking at you. Are you neutral? Are you impartial? Are you independent? Mm. And it's really very powerful. Aleppo again, because the difference between the front line is really 30 meters. So if you want to be able to cross the line, they need to trust you and to feel that you're really dramatically, radically principled, I would argue. So it's an, it's an interesting element. And I think for us over the next coming years, we have no doubt that we will be more and more urban actors. By the way, what we did together, uh, and we really brought all the Red Cross Red Crescent together, we went at the big UN Habitat conference in Quito, which brings all the urban actors every 20 years. And it was interesting, the agenda was totally sanitized. There was nothing about you know, war and conflict. And we really brought that in at the time. And I think it was uh, interesting because cities agreed. You know, we had uh, Mogadishu, we had uh, Medellin, we had uh, Kabul, mayor said, yes, absolutely. A smart city is a city which is able to take off the resilience of their actors. And I would argue what you will see more and more, including in terms of international law, is not just having state willing to engage at the level of, of international law, but I think cities. Cities will be more and more interested because it's again a framework in which they can operate and that's a very interesting things to happen also and to see happening over the next coming years. Cecilia? No, uh, if he's talking about the, the ICRC's special mandate in Geneva Conventions to provide humanitarian services, but not everybody knows that national societies also have under national law and international law a speci uh, specific task to do. So I'll show my third book, because <laughs> in this one, I mean, this is a Swedish uh, book of laws only applicable in times of armed conflict or a greater emergency. I would say not too many people <coughs> read this book very often, but this book is coming back into popularity because when, uh, as Jan mentioned, uh, th when Sweden is looking, how do we become a strong, uh, resilient society in case the worst happens? There are specific roles for the Red Cross movement. Um, there are laws saying what we have to do, what we what we can't do and right now the Swedish Red Cross is really trying to look at where do we need to be today given what's happening in the world today what kind of volunteers do we need to have who can be prepared to act to provide support to the different functions of government and, and the agencies so I invite you all if you find this interesting and thinking this is the kind of new venture of volunteers that we need to recruit to be part of the Swedish preparedness system so the Swedish Red Cross actually has a special role and mandate in right. Sweden. 
under law, under law. to provide specific services. Mm. Jan? I'm not uh, as educated as you are, Cecilia, but I want to point out that when we are in an armed conflict, you said, mm -hmm. and for us it's uh, kind of difficult sometimes to, to tell when, mm -hmm. because if you're working within that grey zone, uh, as a criminal, as a terrorist, uh, creating a bad situation for the population, for the armed forces and, and for the authorities, it's hard to point out uh, that it is a state actor or, or a national a nation standing behind that. And uh, that's the matter for the police and for other authorities. Mm -hmm. And the law is not applicable uh, when, when we have a wartime situation. So that's, uh, uh, should I say, some, somewhere in between two different uh, very very clear situations that uh, we consider an aggressor today will be working for a while. Mm -hmm. And that will spread out uh, over the whole conflict. That they are doing things that uh, will make me a little bit hesitate to, to, to act with, with the armed forces because I don't have the, the mandate. But you would and agree that in any case, even in grey zone, there is always one legislation body which applies. Yes, of Could course. Could be international yeah. law, human rights. Because and what I saw, I was so nervous yeah. over the last 10 yeah. years is some country decided, oh, grey zone, no, no. no law applicable. No, that, no, 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 no. That's actually where we're uh, on to exactly. today. So we are okay. trying to Because I think that's the critical element there. for us. Yeah. And we would yeah. say in any situation, there is yeah. always law which is applicable. Could be international yeah. law or human rights law yes. or national legislation. We don't care. Yeah. As long as there's law applicable. And we've seen when countries decide not to, applicable, to apply law, mm -hmm. how dramatic it is. Then we are legal vacuum, which is dramatic for the people, dramatic for the army, I would argue also, and dramatic for the country. It doesn't know yeah. what to do with it afterwards. And we've seen a very good example over the last few years. Short comment, uh, yeah. Ola. Yeah, I just want to say, that, uh, I, I completely agree, it's not a grey zone regarding laws, no. but mm -hmm. it's a grey zone regarding facts. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's yeah, difficult, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it also relates to the difficulty of ap applying the law, also in urban warfare. It's, I mean, we have the law, the law, the rules of distinction, but it's difficult to apply them in such a small area. But uh, it's important to, I think, to underline the fact that law works, but it's difficult to, to perhaps identify the facts on the ground in a yeah. specific Where are we? Yeah. yeah. But can I just say also on that one, I'm, I'm still a bit nervous because I see also <coughs> that words sometimes are then, you know, allowing country not to live up to their responsibility. And here, one of the words which makes me nervous is terrorism. You know, mm -hmm. war on terrorism, I see some country moving and then deciding that somewhat the standard of mm -hmm. law mm -hmm. is, you know, applicable <laughs> depending on you know, the enemy. And I would say when you come at international public law in general, the standards are very clear, right? I think there are then some way to implement it, but after the standards are very clear. And I'm nervous when I see country lowering their standards depending on the enemy. Because I think over time, that has a huge repercussion uh, on not only the army, but of all of us and what it means in terms of respect of law. Let's end on a positive note here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all agree that uh, international humanitarian law is still relevant. It is to a large extent respected. I mean, we hear about the violations, but you usually don't hear, you know, today the law was respected, yeehaw. Th that's, <laughs> that's something usually the news uh, we won't see there. Uh, but just final, what actions, very, very briefly, what actions and solutions are needed, but also possible on a global and a national level in order to ensure respect for IHL? Because we know, you said IHL, it's still relevant, but we need to work on the respect. So what can we do here now on, on different levels to in enhance that respect in order to protect the civilian population? Jan? If I had uh, a clear <laughs> answer, very short, briefly, <laughs> I, I would probably not have the job I have now. But, uh, I do believe, as I said to begin with, that uh, the war criminals should be set to trial. And our job is to find them and to identify uh, them. And uh, meanwhile, to protect as good as we can with our tools, the civilian population within our mandate. But uh, to have a responsibility set out for them and to, to live up uh, accordingly to our own rules and regulations. That, that's very important for me. Because if we are out in, in a, outside uh, the mm. law book ourselves, uh, we have a total chaos in this. And that will affect us very negatively as well. So act accordingly to the law and uh, try to, to identify those who are, are not obeying the law. On my side, two things. One, sanction. I'm deeply convinced that knowledge is not enough. We know that everywhere. So you need to have a sanction mechanism, which exactly yeah. what it sanctions, in fact, 
crime, war crime, and I think we need to really reinforce that as much as we can. And point two is really prepare for the future. Uh, you know, in, in five to seven years, you will have weapons this size, right? Some of these weapons will fly, nothing new, but what is new is that they won't be any more remotely managed. They will have enough intelligence, artificial intelligence, to be able to come in this room and decide with an enemy, with a friend. For the first time in our history, humankind would have, in a way, outsourced responsibility to tools, to weapons, to in fact make these decisions of killing or not. We need to be prepared for that. And to do that, you need to also look future, you know, making sure that this, you know, the international community is able to work around that, trying to see what does that mean before it happens to us. Artificial intelligence, cyber war, it's already now, and it will happen big time to all of us. So we need to be prepared for that very, very soon. Ola? Yeah. Uh, apart from training and teaching, I also think that um, the ability to uh, to prosecute those uh, suspected of war crimes is very important. And we see this it's very difficult sometimes, like in Syria. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to have a, a local jurisdi uh, jurisdiction, but also international, because it's difficult to, to agree on the Security Council. But there are other ways. We have, an, I think, one positive uh, development is the... Uh, the creation of the triple IM, international mm -hmm. impartial um, um, <laughs> in investigative mm -hmm. mechanism uh, acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, for Syria that Sweden supports and also supports with uh, financially mm -hmm. that will collect all the information on war crimes and then li link to national jurisdictions. And, and Sweden mm -hmm. have successfully, I think, prosecuted more than four cases now based also on uh, on um, films and and pictures so the, mm. they they say i've heard that mm. syrian war is mm. the most documented mm. war since the second world war so there is a lot of information mm. and even though the, the it works slow the, the the process of of justice i think that this will be be able and it may my rely on national jurisdictions mm. at least on during the, the ongoing conflict mm. So, so the digitalization and, and all the propaganda mm -hmm. information can actually help uh, sometimes has, uh, <laughs> to yeah. build cases. Yeah, these yeah. horrific yeah. films also yeah. have, in, in a way, a positive side because it helps to find uh, the criminals and, and to prosecute them. Which has been in all the cases in Sweden that been have, have had a role, the, the films and movies that have been on the internet. Cecilia? Well, obviously, I agree with everybody. Um, I think we also need some peace, love, and understanding in the world <laughs> today. I mean, there's so much hatred and division. There's them and us all over the world. And if we're going to tackle the big challenges to the world, the uh, big migration issues, the big uh, the wars going on and going on, and the environmental issues, we need to start acting as one humanity and not separate into different categories and races and creeds and religions. That's what we need to solve then IHL will work perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. A big thank you to all panelists. Uh, this has been very, very inter interesting. We, I think all of us have learned a lot, the new thoughts and insights. Uh, Eve, uh, we're happy to have you here in, 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 in Sweden. Just a few final words. What are your thoughts after the, the discussion, but also any last uh, key messages for us to, to when we leave the room? I think my, my thinking is, is, first, it sees that it's extremely relevant to discuss, in fact, international limited law, Geneva Convention here in Visby, because you're going to be wondering, you know, what it is. It is more relevant than ever. And I think I, I really have this very strong feeling that our agenda, I yeah, would say the Army agenda, the Red Cross agenda, the Foreign Affairs agenda, is more and more the agenda of everybody. And I think we need to be aware of that. It's not just our story, it's your story. And you have a really important role to play when it comes to international law, when it comes to war, when it comes to what your country is doing. And this is will be more and more important. I'm deeply convinced about that. So it's our Swedish story. That it's your Swedish story. And it's our story in general. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, knowledge is important, but as we have learned, it's not enough. But still, it is important. So please uh, visit redcross.se or icrc.org to learn more about international humanitarian law. Uh, I can also recommend for all of you here in Almedalen, uh, from tomorrow, I think, or the day after, you can visit the Red Cross uh, tent here that is actually will give you a feeling what... Uh, hospital clinic or a room in a conflict zone can look like. Uh, it's quite, quite a strong feeling. Uh, remember that even wars have limits. Thank you and wish you all a good day. Thank you. Thank you.